This podcast is all mine now. <laughs> oh my god. You tried to leave, Hannah, but no one leaves. Which please. Hello and welcome to Witch Please, a fortnightly podcast about the Harry Potter world. I'm Hannah McGregor. I'm Marcel Cosman. And I'm still Neil Bernholden. And welcome to the actual, absolute, final episode of Witch Please. We were kidding with episode 13C, but not this time. This time, we are definitely not joking. <laughs> Wait, but haven't we promised to do episodes about like 20 more things? Like a like a very Potter musical and the three paratextual books and the film script and the new movie and the soundtracks and the audiobooks and... You know, okay, fine. I guess we're not actually that close to done. So how about instead of another ending, we think of this episode as like a new beginning. <laughs> New segments, new characters. Neil, from now on, you are a gentleman with cinema qualifications. You know what, guys? Get ready for a radical rebirth. Wait, should we just start over? Great idea. Hey there. Welcome to the Harry Potter Hour, starring feminism. I'm your host, The Claw. I'm The Hammer. And I'm still Neil Barnholden. We're talking today about the eighth Harry Potter movie, 2011's Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2. But before we get started, let's hear how IMDb... Wait, no. Let's hear how Wikipedia summarizes this movie. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2 is a 2011 British fantasy film directed by David Yates and distributed by Warner Brothers Pictures. That is an extremely accurate summary. Let's start off with our completely reinvented discussion of filmic adaptation, the polyjuice portion. Okay, so we have a lot of really interesting changes that we need to talk about. And the first one that I'm going to spring on you guys entirely is that one of the major shifts that the movie makes is the difference in Harry and Voldemort's relationship to the Horcruxes. So in the books, um, it's very clear that Voldemort cannot tell when a Horcrux is found or destroyed and that there is nothing particularly significant about the Horcruxes themselves as objects that makes them visible to people looking for them, Ah. right? So, like, you can't be in a room with a horcrux and be like, oh, fuck, it's a horcrux. Mm -hmm. You have to use logic and Mm -hmm. problem-solving. It's basically a detective story, trying to figure out what the horcruxes are. And that is totally changed in the movie in a variety of ways, including the fact that the horcruxes are actually much more visually splendid Mm -hmm. than they are in the book, right? Like, um, the Ravenclaw diadem in the book is, like, a rusted, bent, Mm -hmm. insignificant-looking diadem that Harry already saw five books ago, and it never occurred to him that it was interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas this one is, like, beautiful and clearly precious. But also, when Harry's in the room with Horcruxes, he feels it, right? Like, they go into Bellatrix's vault, and Hermione's like, which one's the Horcrux, Harry? And then he just, like, uses his superpowers to find them. Yeah, because in the movie, he doesn't even know what they're looking for, right? Because Mm -hmm. they could be tin cans, because (laughs) Dumbledore did a really bad job at, like, learning from his own research, and failed to tell Harry what they should be looking for, and so they get into the vault, and they're like, literally any of these things could be the Horcrux. I can Horcrux. And then Harry's like, no, I feel it. It's that cup over there that happens to belong to Helga Hufflepuff. Is it in here, Harry? Can you feel anything? Up there. 
Yeah, I I wondered, it feels to me like part of that is specifically about the different medium, that there is something more visual, um, even about the connection between Harry and Voldemort, because in the film, you can cut from one character to another character who's in a totally different place, and to the audience, you infer or assume that those those scenes are taking place at the same time, right, in, in cross-cutting. Um, and I, the special objects, I think, um, thinking about bellatrix's vault the camera sort of directs our attention at the same time that harry is figuring out Mm -hmm. is sort of using his powers Mm -hmm. to sense what the horcrux is Mm -hmm. so i I wonder if part of it is i don't know that kind of mystery is maybe just doesn't work super well on screen even the last movie i thought was much more like a literary style mystery of Mm -hmm. finding people and asking them questions Mm -hmm. and figuring things out uh, but this is much more a kind of race to use your superpowers before the bad guy uses his. Mm-hmm. You know, what that makes me think of is, um, so one of the other differences in this movie when it comes to the Horcruxes is the way that they're, some of them are destroyed. In the book, it's the fiend fire that destroys the Horcrux, but in the movie, he stabs the Horcrux. <laughs> then the fiend fire that is coming at them all of a sudden turns into like a hydra of Voldemort. When they destroy the um, the Hufflepuff cup, it's very similar. The water is Voldemort's face as well. Um, and I just like I think I think you're definitely right, Neil, that it's like a lot more satisfying to watch the Horcrux being destroyed in the movie by stabbing it and seeing these effects happen than to just after the fact be like, oh, look at that. The diadems mm-hmm. all like sticky and bloody. That's weird. But there's a weird kind of inconsistency, though, too, because we we see when Nagini is killed, for example. Uh... <laughs> She explodes into ashes, and there's these sort of spectacular apocalyptic effects. But we know that's not what happened when the diary was stabbed. The diary is still on Dumbledore's desk with a kind of cut through it from the basilisk fang, right? And the locket uh, actually did explode pretty spectacularly. So, yeah, the ring didn't. Yeah, so there, there's a kind of inconsistency, but I, I think... Marcel, the way you described it did make me think it's spectacle. Mm -hmm. It's much more spectacular. Which makes me think about how, like, so one of the things that we've talked about in the books that's really interesting is that not just Harry's form of heroism is being celebrated. Lots of different forms of heroism are celebrated. And there's space for logic and problem solving, not just Harry's sort of miraculous, God-given powers. Like, you know, the powers that he didn't earn, didn't fight for, that were just a coincidence of his birth. Like, those are valuable, but they are not the only valuable ones. Mm -hmm. But, like, those are more fun to watch on screen, and so they are privileged more. And there are moments when that kind of brash heroism is granted to other characters as well, like the moment when Hermione is like, let's jump on this dragon! I've got something, but it's mad! And you're like, Hermione would not jump on a fucking dragon. (laughs) Hermione hates riding things. Like, we know that she's afraid of flying. She would not get on that festral. She's bad at brooms. Hermione would not be the one to say, follow me, guys. But, like, because that's what exciting heroism looks like in an action movie like this. And, And I do think, I think you're right to point out, Neil, that there is a really different tone between the seventh and the eighth movies because in the seventh movie because it was slow and problem solving based and narrative based Hermione could have a line like I'm just extremely logical I see things that other people don't notice Mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden in this movie she's like I'm a dragon cowboy (laughs) 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 yes 
correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think in the book we have Voldemort coming to Gringotts and murdering all the goblins. Yeah, you're correct. Well, because the book is from Harry's perspective, right? And they've left. So yeah. we don't know. I guess he mm-hmm. could. Mm-hmm. But does he does he murder the goblins in in Gringotts or is that just the aftermath of the dragon explosion? Mm-hmm. I got the impression that he had murdered them because everybody else is looking really scared, Uh, which suggested to me that he has just done one of his murder rages. mm -hmm. But you're right. That's that is just a reading. Mm -hmm. Well, and and as we've just seen, our heroes are totally indifferent to a Mm -hmm. goblin being incinerated in front of them with no ability to run because of a spell they put on him. (laughs) That's unfortunate. So I, you know, I don't want it to be true, but if our heroes are the ones who killed all those goblins and Gringotts, I yeah. see that as plausible, mm-hmm. chillingly. Yeah. We also don't know whether Grip Hook dies in the book, right? It's yeah. sort of left a mystery to us. I think actually we know that he takes off with mm-hmm. the sword. We see yeah. him running away with the sword, which is like a very cowardly Semitic thing to do, I guess. And so I guess I feel weird about the fact that we see him. The film is suggesting that he's been punished for that treachery. Yes. Whereas in the book, it's our heroes who are who are attempting to break their word or to not accurately describe what the word is. <laughs> um, but the movie kind of turns that on its head because we have so we have that scene with Ron and Hermione and Harry where they're like, what are we going to do with this? We're going to do with the sword. We need the sword to kill the Horcrux. And Harry's like, I haven't figured that out yet. Shh. And then it never comes up again. I mean, we had a really good time talking about that part in the book because it's really complex and nuanced what they're doing with the representation of these wizards being like, well, we have a right to things, but also that's clearly shown to us to be a morally ambivalent choice. Um, And the way that the goblins are represented and their relationship to the wizards is complicated. And that complexity is really alighted in the movie in the sense that like the goblins lose a lot of their humanity in the movie and that signified to us very clearly through the insignificance of their deaths Mm -hmm. because this movie is really all about whose death counts Mm -hmm. and whose doesn't Mm -hmm. like who do we stop and grieve over and who is it just like that guy died well that i mean that's very much like our discussion of the book when they the part where we were talking about Godric's Hollow and we were, we were focused yeah. on whose death counts and whose death doesn't yeah. and the obelisk yeah. to the muggles who died in the war versus the trio of James Lily and Harry mm-hmm. so it's yeah. interesting that we've come back to that that theme has carried over <laughs> one might say okay so in the last episode we talked about the question of who the narrator of the movie is Mm -hmm. and of how the movies work to sort of incorporate seeing the world through just through harry's perspective versus seeing the world with the kind of objective third person omniscient perspective that the camera often seems to grant us and there's some like there's a couple of different ways that i see the movie handling this one is that It's just rewritten some major scenes to reassert Harry at the center of them. For example, the scene where Snape is confronting all of the students in Hogwarts and Harry just steps out and is like, it's me. It seems despite your exhaustive defensive strategies, you still have a bit of a security problem, Headmaster. You murdered Dumbledore. I'm the hero of this story. I'm afraid it's quite extensive. How dare you stand where he stood? Right, which was like a huge change, Mm -hmm. but also one that did feel like it fit Mm -hmm. into the movie. But at the same time, as Harry's being re-centered in some ways, the film also lets us see some stuff that Harry doesn't get to see, Mm -hmm. including, I think, most significantly, the scene where Ron and Hermione go down to the Chamber of Secrets and destroy Mm -hmm. the cup, which in the book is only reported back to Harry because he's not there. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, it's interesting to me how the movie seems to be both making changes that recenter Harry, but then also doing some other things that give more space to the other characters because the camera can see stuff that Harry can't. Mm -hmm. You know what's really interesting about that? If we can sort of uh, jump back over to Horcruxes for a second, Mm -hmm. what you're saying just made me realize that unlike the locket or Tom Riddle's diary... The cup doesn't put up much of a fight. You do it. I can't. Yes, you can. 
and it in particular doesn't bring up any of Hermione's ghosts and so I guess it makes sense because if, if the film is already taking the liberty of showing a scene it's already entering into original story production instead of adaptation so I guess in that sense it makes sense that it doesn't say like show us all of Hermione's anxieties about being muggle born in the wizarding world blah 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 but at the same time wouldn't that have been so much better wouldn't it have been so much more satisfying to like also have Hermione's horcrux like give the same kind of resistance to being destroyed so that Hermione didn't get the easy one I mean, let's all be honest. Neville got the easy one. I'm just kidding. Voldemort got the easy one. Right? Okay, so, Neil, you want to talk about a theme you noticed. A theme. Before I talk about that, I, I also just... <laughs> I'm seizing the mic. Um, I also just wanted to mention in that scene that you were just describing, Hannah, where uh, Harry confronts Snape. As the Snape is the headmaster and Harry confronts him. I think there's an interesting moment where the assembled students of Hogwarts uh, and we, the audience, take on a similar role. When Harry first steps out, there's these gasps of shock uh, from the audience. It seems despite or from the, well, from the Hogwarts <laughs> students. But what's funny is actually when the Order of the Phoenix did burst into the door there we actually did gasp comparably to how the characters on screen gasp and i just think that's interesting because it's one of the rare moments in harry potter that i can think of along with um uh quidditch matches and uh the triwizard tournament where within the world of the story there is an audience to the events of the story and their reaction can be said to be sort of intertwined with ours and that's fascinating because that scene in particular is playing on the fact that it that they have made changes between the book and the movie recognizing that even for people who think they know what's going to happen they don't Mm -hmm. because it's different Mm -hmm. right so they can take an audience of people who probably many of them do know what happened in the book and then change it in such a way that they can then reproduce for you, the filmic audience, the experience of surprise that the students have. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Mm. Adaptation is neat. <gasps> uh, anyway, as to the theme of the movie, this is what I think the theme of the movie is. In the scene in King's Cross slash heaven uh, at the end, <laughs> <laughs> where Dumbledore is is talking to Harry, Dumbledore says at one point that he's he's always... Uh, I've always prized myself on my ability to turn a phrase. But uh, he also says that words themselves are magic. Our most inexhaustible source of magic. And I think that there's a lot of moments in this film that you could point to where the idea of statements or words in general um, are really important in a way that I think you could argue the theme of this movie is the power of statements. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of all kinds of scenes, Mm -hmm. uh, even when Snape makes his speech to the students and asks them to step forward if they've seen Harry Potter. But even the fact that the movie opens on the words of Dobby's grave Mm -hmm. right after the credits. And it's so important that we see what they have written and that they've written it. And it's a sort of proclamation. But I I was first thinking about it actually in the scene where they're talking to Ollivander. And Ollivander talks about the Deathly Hallows. It is rumored there are three. Together, they make one the master of death. But few truly believe that such objects exist. Do you? Then says that there's no, he never saw any reason to really think about uh, a folk story that way. I see no reason to put stock into an old wife's tale. But then a moment or so later, he says to Harry, if what you say is true... If it's true, what you say, and he has the Elder Wand, I'm afraid you really don't stand a chance. Well, I suppose I'll have to kill him before he finds me, then. Which is the rest of the movie, actually. So I, I just think there's something very central about statements and words in this movie. 
It reminds me of how in the scene where Harry, supposedly dead, has been brought back to Hogwarts and um, Neville comes up and delivers the speech. And I think it was you, Neil, who was like, or was it Trevor? Hi, how are you doing? Who was like, why the hell is he giving a speech? He really blew his shot at attacking Voldemort. I'd like to say something. And... It was like, but that speech is really important because his declaration in that speech is about the nature of heroism. It doesn't matter that Harry's gone. Stand down, Neville. People die every day. Friends. Family. Yeah. We lost Harry tonight. He's still with us. And here... So spread. Remus. Tonks. All of them. They didn't die in vain. But you will. Because you're wrong. <laughs> Harry's heart did beat for us. For all of us. It's not over. <laughs> And foreshadows how multiple people will play a role in the final scenes of the battle to come. I mean, it's speech acts, right? By saying something out loud, I can make it be true. Well, it's also interesting that so much of what we're talking about are these speech acts for an audience. Actually, I I think you're totally right, because uh, Neville starts that speech by saying that he wants to make a speech. Mm -hmm which is sort of needless in the world of Harry Potter, but is a really interesting way of drawing our attention to the fact that he is making a speech yeah. and naming it as such. And I think, too, if we think about that speech that Neville makes and how we see the movie sort of adapting the story into different forms of spectacle, that speech that Neville makes replaces the comment that he makes to Harry in the book about how he's learned that if you just stand up to these people, it gives other people hope. Because that conversation doesn't happen in the film, but instead Neville does precisely what he describes himself doing in the book. There's also, there's, I'm just thinking again about the sort of contrast between the seventh movie and the eighth movie, and about how much of the seventh movie is about what happens in the private sphere. Like, so many of the major scenes are in houses. Right. Um, it's, you know, inside the house in uh, Godric's Hollow, inside Malfoy Manor, inside the tent. Mm -hmm. um, the sorry, what was that you had to say about the scenes in the tent? I was just saying I thought those scenes were pretty intense. Boo. 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 I'm so sorry. So a lot of what's going on is about interpersonal relationships, about private moments, about people working through shit between them. Mm -hmm. And then this movie is about public. The major scenes happen in these major public institutions. It happens mm -hmm. in the bank. It happens in the school. Mm -hmm. It's speeches. It's heroism. It's stepping forward. So it's like a real sort of shift in in the mode of storytelling and just mm -hmm. just a shift in the kinds of action that are happening. And even the private spaces that we find people in in this movie are private spaces made public. So like the Hogshead, which is ostensibly a private space, has been made into a kind of public safe house. Shell Cottage is also declared a safe house. It is not where Bill and Fleur are living. Mm. It's somewhere that they are having to temporarily hide. Like, it's not their mm. home. Yeah. Like, even when we're in things that seem like homes, they're not homes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting, it's like this idea that all of this private stuff needs to be figured out first to sort of set the ground for what will come next. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, Marcel, you want to talk about giants? Yeah, yeah. I want to kind of return to a point that I made when we talked about movie five, where we were talking about Grop and how terrible Grop is and how the whole storyline of Grop gets completely like weird and distorted instead of being about like the value of difference ends up being a stupid story about like heteronormativity and compulsory heterosexuality and how like giants they're just like us they also want to bone little girls like it's all rape culture transcends all kinds of boundaries <laughs> um, 
And one of the things that I had argued was that the giants don't make any kind of return. And so why is it that Grop's story wasn't just written out completely? And so I just want to revisit this point because, yes, I know that there are some giants in this movie, but they are not there in any significant way. I think that the only reason why they even included giants is because they had better special effects to like make them more easily. But like Grop isn't back. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that Grop doesn't come back is indicative of what a goddamn waste of time that storyline was. And we just shouldn't have bothered anyway. I do not feel that the presence of giants in this movie in any way uh, undermines my point. Oh, oh, and if I can just say one other thing about omissions in this movie, I couldn't remember if Creature comes back because in the book, right, we'd learn that Creature is in fact okay because he leads the team of Hogwarts house elves. Of course. And they, they, they wrote that part out. So like we leave Creature and never hear from him again. Mm -hmm. He's just gone forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, speaking of things that are gone, I mean, again, this is, there is only so much stuff that you can include in a movie, but there were some conspicuous omissions, including several of our sort of secondary women characters' backstories. And I know when we were talking about the books, we spent a lot of time talking about how much these women's stories are tied in with rape culture and violence against women. You know, and we looked in particular at the story of Helena Ravenclaw. Um, and her violent death at the hands of the Bloody Baron, as well as the backstory of Lily's falling out with Snape and how that also has implications of Snape's participation in forms of violence against women. Mm -hmm. um, those are both things that are lost entirely. The whole backstory of Helena Ravenclaw is just written out. And I would argue there was time for it mm -hmm. because Harry's confrontation with that ghost lasts a while. Yeah. And uh, we lose everything about Lily between... Her first day at Hogwarts getting sorted into Gryffindor. Or no, sorry, we get one more scene of her like getting bumped by James and then being like, I know I'm 11, but I have a bone for that stupid little boy. And then the next scene is like them getting married. Everything yeah. that would suggest her falling out with Snape is just gone. And we need to, we're going to talk about that later when we talk about the representation of Snape in this movie mm -hmm. um, and what's taken out to make him more sympathetic. But like any implication that, Snape might have been a danger to Lily is gone. And uh, we also lose any sense that Petunia might have had a reason to feel abandoned and betrayed by Lily. So like just a lot of the things that make our female characters complex and nuanced um, has disappeared from this adaptation. So while we're on the topic of characters who are rendered the opposite of complex... We have these sort of strange choices in adaptation where we have a number of visible characters who are people of color, but who don't get to say much. And in most cases, don't get to say anything. In the last movie, we saw that Dean Thomas was completely written out, but then surprise, he's in this movie, so he's there. But he just kind of makes a confused face. For most of it, he doesn't get to act. Mm -hmm. And then the one that really boggles my mind and feels really, it feels like a sinister inclusion is, so the two, the two Slytherins that Malfoy grabs and pulls with him to track down Harry in the Room of Requirement, instead of being Crab and Goyle, are Goyle and Blaise Sabini. And the reason why this feels sinister to me is because it feels very much like somebody at some point is thinking, well, we don't have a whole lot of representation of people of color, and I feel like people are going to be upset about that. So how about we replace that white character with this black character, and we don't need to make any other changes in order to make that character like thoughtful or complex or interesting in any way. We can just put them there, and that'll do the job. I have a word for that. I believe some of you may be familiar with it. It's called tokenism. <laughs> Okay, so there's a couple more sort of significant changes that we want to talk about. We're going to talk about the representation of Harry in Voldemort's final fight and then what happens after that. But before we get into those sort of major set pieces of the movie, Marcel, I believe you have an anecdote to tell us about just one particular line in this movie. You know I love an anecdote. Um, I can't remember if it was a listener of ours who sent us a 
like a Tumblr screen cap or something. I wish I could remember and I tried to find it and I can't. So if this was you, I apologize for not crediting you for sending us this info. Please tweet at us. Bravo. You did a very good job. This is one of the greatest things in my entire life. So apparently when Deathly Hallows Part 2 came out in theaters in er, maybe Switzerland or Germany, the translation of Dumbledore's line to Snape he has her eyes. The way that it was translated used a formal pronoun for her, which is the same pronoun as the word your. And so the whole audience was like, <gasps> because essentially Dumbledore had just said to Snape, he has your eyes, Severus, precisely your eyes. God, that would change the movie so much oh, yeah. if the revelation at that point was that Harry had been Snape's son the whole time. Wow. I think that would have been a better ending. Uh, yeah. And you know what would have been really satisfying, too, is all of that business about how he looks exactly like James would just be evidence that all white men look the same <laughs> and are completely generic in every way. And it's not at all interesting. All right, so let's talk about those final scenes. So, like, a ton of stuff about the Battle of Hogwarts has changed, and in a lot of ways that just make it more effective as as a film scene. I think there's a lot of stuff about the way that those scenes are produced that's really, really powerful. I just did, like, a sweeping hand gesture to show what a scene looks like. Yeah. Whoosh! Oh, a scene. Yeah, now you get it. But one of the big things that they change is that rather than Voldemort first fighting off three Hogwarts professors at the same time before Harry steps in, they have Voldemort and Harry go off by themselves. Mm -hmm. And then Harry leaps into Voldemort's arms, calls him Tom Riddle with a wink. Come on, Tom. Let's finish this the way we started it. Together. And then the two of them fly through the air, <laughs> enthusiastically stroking one another's faces for a while. And it is inexplicable. Oh, and it goes on for so long, too. It's 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 a lot like the dragon scene from Goblet of Fire, where you're just like, I, yes, we get it. This is a movie. <laughs> and, and it just, like... I guess it's really interesting considering what we were talking about earlier in terms of private and public spaces and how important it is that all of these events take place in public spaces. And suddenly, Harry and Voldemort are having this epic battle more or less in private. Mm -hmm. Even though it's out in the open, everybody's inside the castle fighting other people and they're just outside. Can I also ask you to, just out of curiosity... Does Harry and Voldemort's face merge into one at one point? Or do two Voldemort faces merge into one at one point? Um, like, it seems to be visually trying to show us that, like, oh, there's this deep connection between the two of them. Except at this point, the Horcrux, the, say, the part of Voldemort's soul that was inside Harry has died. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, they don't have that connection mm -hmm. anymore. And so that scene makes no sense. Mm -hmm. So, you know, after that, in the confrontation, they keep the same basic premise of, like, Voldemort has bet on his capacity to master the Elder Wand by murdering Snape. And he has misunderstood how the power of the wand works. And what actually happened is it's not about murdering the last person who had it. It's about disarming and earning the wand's trust. So what does Harry do with the Elder Wand in the book? So in the book, Harry uses the Elder Wand to repair his broken Holly and Phoenix feather wand mm -hmm. so that he has his old wand. And then he tells the portrait of Dumbledore that he's going to put the Elder Wand back where it came from, by which we are supposed to infer Dumbledore's tomb. Mm -hmm. um, and Dumbledore is like, that's a great idea. Good job. But... We never actually see that in the book. Yeah. Mm. So something that's interesting about how the book leaves it is that the wand could still be out there. Like maybe yeah. Harry forgets to do it or maybe Ron grabs it and runs away. Yeah. But in the movie, 
he just cracks it over his knee and yeah. tosses it yeah. into the abyss. I'll, have either of you noticed how Hogwarts is built on a cliff? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I never noticed that before, but I was like, wow, I'm surprised that there weren't more accidental children's deaths uh-huh. off of that cliff that the castle is just on. Uh-huh. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> I I digress. Where has that abyss been? But seriously, like, this is the most powerful wand of all time, and you can destroy it by breaking it over your knee? Exactly. I feel like it's part of the the point of it, right? That the wand is always only ever as good as the magician who wields it, but also that wands are fallible. Like, they're just... That's not the phallus word I thought you were going to say. Wands are phalluses <laughs> and can be broken... If you want to badly enough. I mean, picking up on that and thinking about the point of the Deathly Hallows story, I wonder if the thing about that wand is that it's powerful, but if you reject that power, then you can destroy it. Mm -hmm. So it's a powerful offensive weapon, but Mm -hmm. not if you don't actually want it or want to use it yeah Yeah. i mean and that's part of the sort of significance of the whole deathly hallows story right is that like each of the hallows is only as powerful as the way that they are being used i I think it's a more thematically appropriate end for the wand i think Mm -hmm. the way that the book frames the wand as being the least of the hallows and only ever a temptation to power hungry wizards means it should be destroyed Mm -hmm. and i agree it feels dangerous to be like just put it back in Dumbledore's tomb. It'll probably be fine there. Only one person has broken into his tomb and he's been dead for a year. So, (laughs) so probably that's the safest place in the world. (laughs) What? You just had a revelation? Just, I just remembered something that I've been wanting to talk about ever since I remembered that it was going to happen like months ago. And it's one of the major changes that they make in the movie adaptation. And it's something that like kind of bothered me, but now I'm not sure if I care about it, but I still want to bring it up. And it's the fact that in the book, it's really important that Harry willingly goes into the forest and willingly dies so that Voldemort will not be able to kill any more people. Mm -hmm. And that what he does is he casts the same protective spell over his friends and community so that Voldemort can't hurt them mm-hmm. again. But that gets written out of the movie. And I think that that's too bad because I really love that. So it's not just like a mother's love for her son that is powerful, but it's like anybody can like love their people enough to protect them from harm. Anybody can do this. Are you ready for a whole new radically transformed segment about casting and performances and the development of these characters across eight films? Get ready for the Muggle-Born Registration Commiseration. Well, one thing that I wanted to talk about about casting and performances is the role of the idea of the cameo in this movie, because there are a lot of actors and characters who reappear from previous episodes and even uh, movies movies <laughs> um oh i i haven't been watching the movies i just listened to the witch please episodes previously on harry potter no uh and the, there's even i was even thinking uh, when the spiders reappear during the battle that that's not casting at all that it seems like there's a lot of ideas of callbacks or cameos or reappearances i was just wondering what you guys thought about that the, the Cornish Pixies hanging yes. out in the Room of Requirement. Yes. Yeah, yeah. This movie really felt to me in a lot of ways kind of like a like an homage to the rest of the films, right? Mm-hmm. So it's sort of like, this is the last one. Not unlike this episode, I guess, where we're just making nonstop homages to our previous episodes. Are you going to put in hooting every time you mention owls? Every time. Every, every oh, yeah. time. every single time. Even when I mention owls? Every right? single time, Neil. Wow. Yeah. Owls. Yeah. Wolves. Yeah. Well, cats. Cats. Yep, the night bus. Night bus. <laughs> gonna be a Hell's Wolves cat <laughs> night bus. A rich sound tapestry. You're welcome, a, Marcel. A cornucopia of sound, dear listeners. <laughs> There's just sort of like nonstop references to things that we've seen before. 
which I think is great, but doesn't quite make up for all the things that we should have seen before, <laughs> but then didn't like the diadem. <laughs> it's a really interesting visual production of nostalgia. The movies are saying to you, like, we have created a world. We introduce you to this whole cast of characters. You want to see them all again. You are going to be excited at the reintroduction of Cornish Pixies and the reappearance of the spiders. And the, yeah, it's hailing the audience in a very particular way. It's saying to the audience, like, you feel, you are going to be excited to catch a glimpse of this person or saddened to catch a glimpse of this other person. You know, the, the fact that Lavender Brown's character, for example, never talks has no scenes in this movie except for the sight of her dead body, which is very clearly saying, like, this is going to be moving only for people who have watched the previous movies and have an emotional investment in this character mm -hmm. that comes from the previous movies. So, like, in that way, it is really, like, it's refusing to try to stand on its own. That might be one of the pleasures of making a part two because it's not a sequel really it's like the second half and mm -hmm. so in that sense they can really play on mm -hmm. the like not independence of this movie especially with an adaptation right if you're having to make an adaptation but that does not by its very nature have any need to stand on its own you can really sort of relish in all of those like tropes of connectivity uh -huh. I don't know if that's an actual thing but I made it one Tropes of connectivity. Neil? Yeah, I no, I, th I think it is connectivity and recognition. There, there's some, it's a sort of mutual recognition where you recognize what's happening on the screen, but the screen is acknowledging your recognition mm -hmm. of that. I was particularly struck by uh, Slughorn, actually, because, um, well, actually, Slughorn and Trelawney, the two appearances that they make are basically hailing the camera. Mm -hmm. They're sort of acknowledging the audience, but also you are recognizing them. I, I think connectivity is a good word for that, actually. And so in that spirit, for a lot of our main characters, we get just these moments with them, like not extended scenes, but lovely little moments. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple that really stand out. I mean, I think the um, Molly Weasley's Not, not My Daughter, my daughter is You Bitch <laughs> is one of the greatest moments in filmic history. <laughs> And her face after she successfully kills Bellatrix is murderous and amazing. <laughs> when uh, Professor McGonagall casts the spell that brings all the statues to life to protect Hogwarts. Pierre Totem Locomoto! And says, I always wanted to use that spell. I've always wanted to use that spell. They just all get these like little tiny moments, but there are so many just making sure to give those beloved characters nice little moments. <laughs> It just occurred to me too, Percy is there. Percy is at the Battle of Hogwarts, but the movies have totally written out his estrangement from the family. And so they didn't need to bring him back, but the fact that they do and that it's the same actor, I think is a really, a really lovely touch. Yeah. Because for those of us who remember him from the earlier movies, you're like, hey, there's Percy. Yeah. He came back. I'm thinking about the casting of the goblins and the decision um, to make all of the goblins played by little people, actors. Mm -hmm. And the way that that does interesting things with the book's treatment of the goblins in terms of their otherness. Mm -hmm. Because the books are constantly driving home to us the necessity of reading the goblins as others. Mm -hmm. As like semi-monstrous others who really do not fit in. And the decision to sort of code that otherness in the films via a very particular kind of body 
and you know people who have a history of being cast in fantasy movies as mm. non-human others right. and so it's trading on that history and obviously the prosthetics and the teeth and the hand claws and all of those things are furthering that monstrosity but there's also this way in which the movie is i think encouraging us to just read the bodies of the goblins as Mm non-human and that that non-humanness is being conflated with their size Mm -hmm. in a way that i find a little a little troubling yeah yeah if we think about the closest other contemporary representation of goblins we have the lord of the rings and the hobbit series of goblins right so the goblins in the lord of the rings are still have a lot of those like goblin tropes but are not played by non-normative bodied actors. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that there is something troubling about this conflation of goblins with little people because in the Harry Potter world, we don't have any little people with the exception of Flitwick. Mm -hmm. But I feel as though the way in which the Harry Potter world responds to non-normative bodied people is to assume that they have, and I put this in huge scare quotes, the blood, end of scare quotes, of a non-human person, right? So we have like Hagrid, who is part giant. I can't remember if we ever hear this or read this, but I think we can relatively safely assume that Flitwick has maybe some goblin blood in him, and that's why he's little. So there are no just like little people wizards. And that's, that's bad. Yeah, I think I think it also is part of a really unpleasant tradition that a lot of movies and and TV also engage in where little people are seen to be so non-normal as to be surreal or as mm. to suggest something wrong. I mean, I do think about something like Twin Peaks does that. Oh yeah. Where basically a a little person just by existing indicates that yeah. something is happening outside the realm of reality, which is actually so deeply deeply <laughs> horrifying mm-hmm. and and actually just disrespectful i think yeah. to to mm-hmm. the fact that people really do exist yeah. actually yeah. Mm-hmm. so i i think the association with the genre of fantasy is mm-hmm. actually pretty troubling i mean yeah. it, it's really distressing that a person's actual body would be a special effect it sort of conjures up the idea of, of a freak show honestly yeah, exactly. honestly it does yeah, yeah. On a totally different subject, Mm -hmm. let's talk about the Malfoys. I find the role of the Malfoys in this movie really interesting. Mm -hmm. And that moment, because that is a film, that is a creative for the movie Mm -hmm. moment, where Draco is on the side with his classmates and then his father, like Lucius, who is at that point just like, full-on nervous breakdown Mm -hmm. is like frantically calling him over and Draco's like, ah, maybe not. Draco. 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 And then his mother just says, come. Draco, come. Like a puppy. And he does. And on the way, he gets the world's worst hug. Oh, <laughs> oh it's the hug you get when you've well been very done. bad. Oh, such a bad hug. Well done. And I mean, so that, you know, that brings us back to the way that I think the performance of the Malfoys in the movie is maybe more straightforwardly sympathetic Mm -hmm. than it is in the books because you just see how devastating what has happened to their family Mm -hmm. is. And uh, in particular, Narcissa Mm -hmm. is just this like sympathetic mother character. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, but she's also a terrible person. Mm -hmm. But then we get that amazing scene where the Battle of Hogwarts is going on and you see the three of them just fucking bolting just like out of there. And it's like, oh, okay, so they're not bad guys and they're not good guys. They're just gone guys. Movie Malfoys don't know how this is going to go down. And either way, they're 
not going to be anybody's favorites, so they're out. But there's Draco back at the end with a receding hairline and a shitty beard. <laughs> okay, let's talk about a few more of our side characters. Um, Luna features quite a bit more prominently in this movie. And, you know, they give her this one really important moment, which is that she's the one who understands the diadem and that it's her relationship with Helena that allows Harry to get the diadem in the first place. It goes back to what we were talking about in the adaptation segment about the ways that the movie both simplifies the forms of heroism by trying to produce heroism that like plays well on the screen, but also still tries to build in these spaces for our different main characters to still give them their moments. Mm -hmm. And I really like that Luna's moment is about the fact that she is kind Mm -hmm. and the fact that she builds relationships with people who others don't want to talk to or don't Mm -hmm. pay attention to. And that that relationship building, that connectivity becomes entirely central to Harry's ability to like perform his heroic task Mm -hmm. because like, that ghost is not going to talk to him mm-hmm. except that Luna vouched for him. Yeah. 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 And there's also that scene that you loved when Luna sits down next to Neville. Do you yeah. want to describe it for our yeah, listeners? I do. I do. There is this really precious moment that I really enjoyed where um, after the battle, Neville is just sitting there with the sword mm-hmm. looking really peaky. And Luna just sits down next to him. And then they just sit quietly next to each other. And I really, really enjoyed that. And I think one of the things that I enjoyed about it is that I like that it didn't overtly turn their fondness for each other into a, like, there didn't need to be a romantic kiss between them. Mm -hmm. It was just, like, they're friends. They're just sitting together. It's really sweet. You know what I think is so important about that is we have, especially in movies, this idea that you are either friends or you are lovers or you are neither. Yeah. There's none of this, like, it is, in movies, it is impossible for one person to be in love with another person and for them to still manage to be friends if that love is not reciprocated. And so what I really like about that scene is that we don't know how Luna feels about Neville beyond the fact that she cares about him very much. And so the fact that there's no, like, awkward kiss, there's no, like, well, I don't love you, therefore we can never speak to each other again. It's just this, like, really wonderful moment of, like, tenderness and caring for one another community if you will (laughs) themes okay so on the other side of that tender moment we have our much beloved neville longbottom not so secret hero of the movie just so 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 good in this movie um i love the speech that he gives Mm -hmm. to voldemort a speech that is like neville understands the themes of this movie better than voldemort does Mm -hmm. neville understands that like no harry could actually be dead right now And we would still have a shot at beating you. In fact, Harry coming back was not necessary. It helped, but it wasn't necessary. He wasn't the only one who could kill Voldemort. I mean, that line, like Neville says, you know, people die every day, which is this really like, we loved Harry, but like, like we all, we've all lost lots of people. Mm -hmm. We're not, you did not break us by killing this one person. And, uh, and then he kills a snake and that's really awesome. I enjoy the way that it is framed in the film as him waking up in the the hall and being like oh there's a sword line on the ground here i guess i'll just pick the sword up and just like see what happens it's just it's really it is all really wonderfully done i like that neville is allowed to be a hero in the movie and still be neville i'm not sure if this is different from the books but also neville just kills nagini because nagini's about to attack ron and hermione right Mm. he has no idea that he's destroying the last Horcrux. Oh my god, that is so much more heroic than in the book, because in the book, Harry's like, kill the snake. Kill the snake. Just make sure that the snake is dead. Neville, kill the snake. And Neville's like, you got it, Harry. I'm not sure that that's the case in the movie. No, definitely not. I, so it's possible in the, to read the movie, Neville, as not actually knowing mm-hmm. that his kind of act of trying to save just two of his friends is yeah. actually the most important thing that anyone does. What a swell guy. A real mensch. Okay, so we talked a little bit, I think, in the last episode about um, Polyjuice Potion, but we wanted to get a bit more into the really interesting thing that happens in this movie where you get to see actors, in this case, Helena Bonham Carter, 
pretending to be somebody else pretending to be her, Mm -hmm. which is much like how we were talking in the last episode about like Snape lying and how you act a lie. Mm -hmm. Polyjuice Potion is also a really intriguing acting Mm -hmm. challenge that Helena Bonham Carter does an absolutely amazing job of. Well, how do I look? Helena Bonham Carter's job is so good that I often forget that it's not Emma Watson playing Helena Bonham Carter. I regularly, whenever I talk about how great the scene is, and I say regularly because it does come up relatively often in conversation with me, I'll do this thing where I'm like, oh my God, Emma Watson is just so good at, no, that's (laughs) Helena Bonham Carter Uh playing Emma Watson. No, sorry. Helena Bonham Carter playing Hermione playing Bellatrix. And it's so convincing Uh that you forget that that's not Hermione. It's amazing. It reminds me of the conversation we had about the sort of joke conversation about Brendan Gleeson as Moody and our sort of imagined scenario in which David Tennant does the entire movie in Brendan Gleeson makeup and then Brendan Gleeson does an imitation of his performance, um, which is very funny. We're very funny. Um, But again, there's this like real emphasis in multiple characters on like this consistent acting challenge of the double edge like your performance is a performance you are pretending to be somebody pretending to be somebody else and it's it's pulled off so effectively but there's also something that we were noticing watching this movie which is the point of Brandon Gleason's performance is that um Barty Crouch Jr is unrecognizable as moody right by which i mean like the people closest to him can't tell Mm -hmm. literally the only person who can figure it out is his own father um for everybody else people who have known moody for years you can't tell and snape as well Mm -hmm. like is such a good double agent that even voldemort can't tell that all of our protagonists can't tell and there are these characters who are so good at disguise and lying and manipulation but when our protagonists do it um whenever we see them using polyjuice potion they are consistently incompetent Mm -hmm. they are consistently incredibly bad at pretending to be anything other than they are they are bad at lying they are bad at imitation they are Mm -hmm. bad at being double agents and there's a couple of ways you can read that on the one hand they are kids Mm -hmm. right so that is part of it but i also think that there's an interesting equation of like being bad at performance with like moral uprightness and Mm -hmm. honesty this like if you are a good person you are true to yourself you will be bad at hiding your motives you will be Mm -hmm. bad at lying You will be bad at subterfuge, which sort of takes me back to this anxiety that is actually characteristic of the modern age, which is when we started to understand psychology and the fact that it is possible for people to appear to be one thing and actually be something else. Mm -hmm. Um, That like the inner world versus the outer world and our realization that there are things happening inside people's heads that are not (laughs) identical to how they're performing. And the, the anxiety that that causes and the desire for our protagonists to be legible and to be bad at lying, that that somehow seems a sign of morality. Mm -hmm. And that these movies use magic and particularly the sort of nature of film as a way of playing out, you know, what it means to lie, what it means to pretend to be somebody else, who we trust and who we don't, who is what they look like and who isn't what they look like, Mm -hmm. really happens Mm -hmm. visually in the films in really interesting ways. I think there's a connection between what Hannah's pointing out, uh, the idea of a stable identity and of uh, a legible identity signifying a good or a moral mm-hmm. identity or meaning to a character. And what we were talking about in the last episode about the the fascist desire for absolute categories, for mm-hmm. categories where you are you are absolutely in a category, no matter what it is. And... Uh, Hannah and I actually went on a long tangent, which we did not record, lamentably, uh, talking about the origins uh, of Victorian biology 
actually, which is also Victorian psychology because that's how they thought about it. But just that idea that actually it, it is fairly recently in human history that the idea that there might be a disconnect between an inner life and an outer life uh, becomes really important and becomes rooted in the language of science. And I think that's what underlies both psychological classifications and racial ones. Mm. So, I mean, it's in the 19th century that famously you suddenly become a homosexual or you become mixed race Mm. or you become these things that did not exist in earlier periods. There would only be actions Mm -hmm. that could be classified in a certain way. Yeah, it's just interesting to think about because the movie does enforce the idea that it is sinister and wrong that Barty Crouch Jr. acts as Mad-Eye Moody and Mm -hmm. is a functioning defense against the dark arts teacher Mm -hmm. for an entire year. Or that uh, Pettigrew is a rat Mm -hmm. for an extremely long time, that he functionally is one in a way that our heroes can't even pretend to be lowly Ministry of Magic employees for a short period of time. So there is something strange about, despite the series's overt politics, it still reinscribes that idea that there are absolute categories and that actually it's good to have a stable identity. Mm -hmm. And I think if you extend that too far, it does become quite sinister. Yeah. Uh, This is just tying back to what we were talking about in the first section about the public versus the private and speech acts. You can then take the film's attachment to people having stable identities. You can read the Deathly Hallows Part 1 as our three protagonists establishing those stable identities, you know, working through their demons, figuring out their relationships with each other, purging any unspoken anxieties or thoughts so that in this movie they can all, you know, speak confidently from a place of like my inside matches my outside perfectly. Mm -hmm. And so we see things like the narrative of Harry's doubt about Dumbledore gets written out entirely so that Harry is just like, I believe in Dumbledore and like everybody has lost their anxiety And I think that that version of identity that is a perfect correlation between what you appear to be on the outside and what you are on the inside, like sort of functions theoretically within the same world in which speech acts are possible, Mm. which is to say that the whole idea of the speech act, which is like, I can say something and make it be true through the act of saying it, is premised on this idea of identity, which is like my performance perfectly matches what I am inside, right? So there is, I do think that that there are ways of reading these last two movies as having a fairly conservative notion of identity and public identity and maturation, which mm-hmm. is sort of moving into having a public identity that is stable and whole, that is conservative in some like vaguely unsettling ways. Yeah. Well, I mean, surely, dramatically, the actual darkest moment in this movie is when Voldemort says that there is a place for Neville Neville on his side. Mm. Right? Well, Neville, I'm sure we can find a place for you in our rank. I'd like to say something. And it's immediately before Neville turns things around by revealing that, you know, all is not lost (laughs) through through Harry's death. There's a a cat in, in my face. It's okay. It's okay. Um, yeah, but I, I think it's less that he offers Neville a place and that he introduces the idea that Neville actually can be mm. on the other side, yeah. right? I think I think he says there there yeah. could be a place yeah. for you here. Yeah. Yeah. It's so sinister, just in terms of both speech acts and identity, right? Yeah. Oh, man. Whew. In the middle of Neville's speech, when the camera goes back to Voldemort and he's just grinning... Fuck. Yeah. Ray finds us so good in this movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what were you going to say about Apologies Potion? Okay, so I remember you posing the question at one point, does it change your voice? Yeah. And in this movie, we see that it doesn't yeah. because it's the voice of Emma Watson coming out of Helena Bonham Carter's mouth, which is also probably why I always get so confused about whether or not it's Emma Watson or Helena Bonham Carter <laughs> acting in those scenes. <laughs> But then when you were talking, you reminded me about Brendan Gleeson. Mm -hmm. So Mad-Eye Moody, it's not David Tennant's voice as Mad-Eye Moody. So there's like an internal discontinuity in how Polyjuice Potion functions. And I think we can all agree that it would have been an epic spoiler if every time Mad-Eye Moody spoke, it was the (laughs) voice of David Tennant, right? Sure would have. 
But I feel like that is one of those continuity errors that reveals the extent to which the only logic that makes that make sense is that evil people are good at deception uh, and good people are not. Because re- there's no in-world story logic that makes that make sense mm-hmm. at all. Good point. I think that is actually a great example of an error that reveals a sort of logic that supersedes the actual story logic. All right. Speaking of people who are good at subterfuge, let's talk about Severus Snape, mm-hmm. who is uh, Neil. What would you What would you call Snape? Well, Hannah, I would say that for most of this movie, he's a Dumble agent. Boo. So. I want to start off just by saying that I fucking love Alan Rickman's performance in this. That This is where we get the most Alan Rickman mm-hmm. of, and he gets the Alan rickman mm-hmm. because he talks more than he has in most of the other movies. And um, that scene where he's giving the speech to the students, and he is just... Many of you are surely wondering why I have summoned you at this hour. Milking every word. It's come to my attention that earlier this evening, Harry Potter was cited in Hogsmeade. Now, should anyone, student or star, attempt to aid Mr. Potter? And uh, there is this possibly apocryphal story about Maggie Smith during that scene getting so frustrated with Alan Rickman because, like, it was taking him so long to get a single sentence out. And she's like, could you please do this faster? <laughs> like, and just that image of him just being, like, unique. And Maggie Smith just like, ah, hurry it up. It's just, that just fills me with joy. But you, I think, Neil, you pointed out that he's so careful and politic about his use of language in this scene that the things that he say, in fact, always have potential double meanings. Student or star attempt to aid Mr. Potter, they will be punished in a manner consistent with the severity of their transgression. Furthermore, any person found to have knowledge of these events who fails to come forward will be treated as equally guilty. If anybody is found, they will receive the punishment they deserve. If you ally yourself with Harry Potter, you will be treated in the same way as him. Like, nothing that he says actually commits one way or the other to, like, I'm going to kill Harry Potter or I'm secretly on Harry Potter's side. Mm -hmm. It's all so careful because he is a consummate spy. Mm -hmm. So he speaks in double talk all the time. Mm -hmm. Everything he does is legible in multiple ways. He is constantly unreadable like the film lets him be unreadable and that like that is all very interesting because it is a great acting job and Alan Rickman pulls it off incredibly well but then it is also interesting that his moment of redemption has to be about reading him right it has Mm -hmm. to be about him becoming fully legible and Mm -hmm. authentic and revealed and known to our protagonist because his illegibility is part of his sinisterness and his potential villainy and it's only once you know once his private thoughts become public thoughts because Mm -hmm. Harry knows them that Mm -hmm. he can be a good guy I'm really intrigued by this idea it had never actually occurred to me until you pointed that out Neil that he does speak in double talk that was actually our erstwhile tech support Trevor Chow Fraser who pointed that out sorry just wanted to be clear holy shit hi how are you doing So, yeah, the thing that I wanted to say about that is um, what I find really interesting is this idea of doublespeak in relation to what Dumbledore says about words being your greatest magical resource and that words have a kind of magical power. Because there's nothing that says that a spy can't just lie, right? So, like, Mm -hmm. Snape could have said... If you're hiding Harry Potter, you will be executed. Mm -hmm. But if we think about the importance of the words that he uses in relation to the power that words have, there is a sense that it is important for him to speak that way because he could unwittingly 
put into action a series of events that could lead to the people who are hiding Harry being harmed in some way. And so I think that that is so uh, exciting and revelatory. Mm -hmm. And really, again, a product of the movie, not a product of the books. Good Mm -hmm. job, movie. Good job, Alan Rickman. So we had already talked in the last episode about how it's Alan Rickman's performance that is really responsible for making Snape into the romantic hero that he has become as a character. And I would just like to confirm, based on my experience of watching this movie, that, like, I was vocal about disliking Snape as a character in the book. And I fucking cried in that scene where Snape said always. Lily. all this time. Always. Like, I I was entirely sold Mm -hmm. on Snape as a romantic hero. But I think that that is, having watched it again, I think that that is not purely a product of Alan Rickman's performance, Mm -hmm. though that is a big part of it because he is brilliant, but also a product of what is left out of that storyline and how that storyline has changed. So let's talk about that. How is that storyline changed? Um, well, we talked earlier in the adaptation segment about the backstory between Snape and Lily, the way that that gets sort of truncated. Um, but one really major change is the fact that the scene when Snape approaches Dumbledore for help, Snape himself Shoot. says, Hide her. Hide them all. I beg you. Whereas in the book, he's like, can't you just give him the baby? <laughs> Dumbledore's like, you're a disgusting monster. Like, you are a bad person. So I think that that's a pretty significant omission. Yeah. As is the scene, like, the scene of Snape cradling Lily's dead body in his arms and crying is not in the book. And that is a powerful scene. Um, that makes me believe his love for her in a way that a book Snape did not convince me of. And I mean... The fact that the thing that Harry gathers to get Snape's memories is not some weird fucking mystery smoke emitting from him, but tears. It's like that Snape is a character characterized by grief, not bitterness or pettiness. Any other acting performances, anything that we want to talk about? I really lament that Michael Gambon doesn't play Aberforth. <laughs> I mean, they're not twins. I know they're not twins, but like movie <laughs> makeup makes people look different. It's just like, and so here's the reason why, okay? Aberforth is supposed to look strikingly like Dumbledore, except he doesn't have a broken nose. He's supposed to look so much like Dumbledore that every time Harry sees his I in the mirror he thinks that it is Dumbledore the actor who plays Aberforth doesn't look anything like Michael Gambon uh, they literally all white men with beards look the same what are you talking about it's <laughs> a good point um I just did see this in my notes but I just wanted to point out that I think um an interesting thing that Ray Fiennes does as Voldemort mm-hmm. I mean it's quite obvious he plays Voldemort as being quite calm with these breaks in temper mm-hmm. where he, he loses his temper and sort of freaks out. And, and in the case of this movie, it's that scene that you were mentioning earlier, Hannah, where he, he laughs at Neville's speech and then starts throwing fire everywhere <laughs> a few minutes later. But what I think is interesting that I had never really thought about before is that Voldemort, I think, is sort of p- performing a competence that is fairly undeserved in a lot of cases. <laughs> I was thinking about in this uh, movie how there's the scene where he is counseled to call off the attack on Hogwarts and just go after Harry Potter himself, and he refuses that. 
And then when his attack on Hogwarts fails, calls out Harry Potter to go after him himself. But Voldemort's performance is not that he realizes he was wrong. It's that he performs a kind of calmness and competence. Mm -hmm. I just think it's interesting that we've been talking about the idea of a performance that hides the opposite of that emotion within it. And I think that it's an interesting thing that Ray Fiennes does where I get the sense in this movie more than in the others that Voldemort is someone who pretends to be calm and assured and is not. The moment where he strays from that is really perfect and very small, but it's when they're in the forest and Harry's wearing the invisibility cloak and you hear Voldemort say, I thought he would come. And he says it in this way where he's like genuinely surprised that he was wrong. You see, you really hear just this very brief moment of self-doubt. It could be such a one note character who I frankly, I found in the books just seems unremittingly evil. One of the going back to that sort of villains are good at pretending to be something else. Like one of the signs in the book early on that Tom Riddle is going to be a bad guy is that he's charming. Mm -hmm. Charm is something that you are when you are a liar. Mm -hmm. None of our protagonists are charming. Especially not Ron. Especially not Ron, my God. (laughs) Um, But that's like Ron's social incompetence becomes a sign of his sturdy loyalty and virtue, right? He's genuine. Yeah. Yeah. So I love the way that finds layers that charm into the like sociopathic Voldemort that he has this sort of like twisted Mm -hmm. distorted echo of the charming person Tom Riddle was still coming through in his performance Mm -hmm. of Voldemort but it's so sinister Mm -hmm. the way he does it Mm -hmm. yeah like a like a terrible hug (laughs) the terrible hug that hug is the greatest moment in this movie And now for something completely different, we're going to talk about sets and special effects and the material production of this world in a totally new segment called The Room of Require Chat. This movie makes me wish that the world of Harry Potter nerddom did a better job of making wands available. By which I mean, like, the wands are so different from each other. They're not variations on a theme. They are radically different shapes and sizes and aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And they are all so beautiful and they're all so clearly unique. And it makes me acquisitive. But that brings me into the artisanal versus the mass produced as represented in the wizarding world. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned before the specialness of the Horcruxes as objects, which is represented aesthetically, and that there's only a very few moments in which we see mass-produced objects in these movies. And when objects are mass-produced, they are sinister. Mm. It's the disastrously multiplying treasure in Bellatrix Lestrange's vault. It's the mass-produced pamphlet being produced by a fascist government, like Mass production is a sign of evil, whereas artisanal, unique, special, individual objects are what the wizarding world is built around. And that's interesting from a Benjaminian perspective, (laughs) by which I mean Walter Benjamin, this German cultural critic, made this argument for the way the objects signified differently, specifically art signified differently before mass reproduction and mechanical reproduction became a thing. And his argument was essentially that objects that were unique and created individually by an artist or an artisan have this aura about them, the specialness that adheres to the object because it was created specially just for you and is unique, whereas the mechanically reproduced object does not have that aura because it was not created specially for an individual Um, And is supposedly every copy is identical. And like wands, for example, the whole power of wands is all about aura. 
It's all about the sort of specialness of this uniquely created object and the relation that an individual has with that object by virtue of its uniqueness. Mm -hmm. So it's like a very pre-modern treatment of objects. Mm -hmm. I'm just realizing right now that I'm a very Benjaminian tourist. And when I go places, I have no desire for the like mass produced souvenir. I always want something that's like artisan made, locally made, especially crafted, blah, blah, blah. Except that I'm also willing to buy souvenirs that look as though they've been specially crafted. Mm. And I'm just learning this about myself right now. And I just felt like I wanted to share that with our listeners. Because the aura is linked to authenticity. Mm -hmm. And the thing that we want as tourists is a sign of the authenticity that we associate with foreign cultures. Mm -hmm. And you want to bring an authentic piece of that culture back home with you Mm -hmm. because it signifies in a very different way. Like I was there and I experienced this culture in a meaningful way. Yeah. I mean, and that's, this also ties us into um, Pierre Bourdieu's work where he talks about cultural capital. So capital is the value that things have and cultural capital is the value that attaches to things that has to do with representations of class rather than wealth. So the point is that a lot of the ways that we, use objects and choose the objects that we're going to have are about showing people that we are of a particular class rather than that we have a particular amount of money. A certain kind of middle class person or a certain kind of upper class person does not always want the most ostentatious object. They want an object that signifies their class position Mm -hmm. via signifying the kinds of things their class gives them access to, like education and travel. Okay, so this is why jeans that are full of tears and rips can be a sign of your class, even though they're full of holes. So it's not that the holes are because you can't afford nice jeans. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's the whole problem in The Great Gatsby of like old money versus new Mm -hmm. money and how you can be as rich as you want, but if you don't know how to negotiate the class performance, you know, that image of Gatsby with his like hundreds and hundreds of shirts. Mm -hmm. When you are new money, you think that the point of objects is just to have as many of them as possible. Mm -hmm. And you don't understand that like class isn't about just acquisition. It's about a particular coded kind of acquisition. Mm -hmm. In conclusion, that is what is going on when hipsters care so much about having artisanal everything. Hipsterdom is about class performance and about an age of sort of easily mass-produced objects performing your class by showing that you can have special objects. And this movie makes me want a fucking wand. (laughs) It makes me want a special thing that was made for me by an artisan because I am so fucking middle class. Okay, doesn't that make it so interesting then that it's horcruxes that literally have an aura of the most evil wizard in the world's soul in them, and that they are all these unique, handmade, kind of medieval, pre-industrial products. Uh, I mean, they're not products, actually. They're they're works of art. Isn't isn't it interesting, then, that, I mean, in Harry Potter, the aura is actually an overwhelmingly negative one, that those objects have to be found and destroyed? I don't know. I'm just, I'm thinking, it seems to run against the portrayal of wands, where it's of the utmost importance that they are individual Mm -hmm. and belong to a specific person. And another thing that ties into that is the way in which um, when Sirius moves back into number 12 Grimmauld Place, he's so intent on just throwing out all of the old markers of his family's class right it's not that he's throwing out like old broken toasters and shit that his parents have been hoarding it's all of these like very unique artisan made handcrafted candelabras and lockets Mm -hmm. and stuff neil made the very funny joke during one shot of the room of requirement that wizards really love inefficient storage we keep seeing these wizarding spaces that are just like heaped with shit but what both the room of requirement and bellatrix lestrange's vault made me think of is a cabinet of curiosities what's the history of cabinets of curiosity i associate uh, and i may be wrong about this it's not my area of expertise or anything but i associate it with an early modern sort of imperial idea of the world where you collect curiosities of freaks of nature as they would have been known or unique or original objects 
or for that matter, just exotic or foreign objects, and then display them in your home in a kind of cabinet of wonders of yeah. sorts to show that you have access to those flows of information or trading, or that you've been there yourself. Yeah. So kind of tourists when, you know, there were only like a thousand tourists in the world. Yeah. The cabinet of curiosity aesthetic is mostly tied to dark wizards, right? We see it in Borgen and Burks. We see it in Bellatrix's vault. We see it in the Black Household, a series is trying to get rid of those things. Like that image of having acquired a bunch of rare, special, exotic objects mm -hmm. and holding onto them as a sign of your class and your power, that acquisition of coded objects is a thing that our good wizards mostly don't like mm -hmm. that immediately made me think i'd never thought about this before but of the contrast or the significance of the fact that dumbledore just has a big bowl of candy he really loves candy yeah. like mass-produced cheap yeah. children's candy yeah. i never thought about the contrast yeah. between that though yeah. And when we see Dumbledore's desk covered with things, those things are his own inventions. And remember at the end of book five, when Harry's breaking all of Dumbledore's stuff and Dumbledore responds very calmly and is like, please, by all means, I have too many things. So even, even the things that are special are still just nothing to him. Yeah, and the objects themselves, the three special objects that Dumbledore leaves for our heroes... None of those objects are actually about the objects themselves. They're all about the lessons that the heroes are going to learn. Mm -hmm. And once they've learned those lessons, the objects can be discarded. Mm -hmm. Like the Deluminator was valuable because it helped Ron to come to terms with the air he had made and find his friends again. And then after that, you never see the Deluminator again. You never see the book after Hermione has figured out what the symbol for the Deathly Hallows means and the snitch itself did not matter, and we don't see this in the movie, but in the book, Harry throws the resurrection stone into the woods. This willingness to, like, dispose of objects is a sign of our good characters of the proper relation to the world. And in the movie, that's really even more emphasized in the fact that Harry breaks that wand in half. Mm -hmm. Even the wands, which are these, like, these special objects that can be special to our good characters, still... The movies in particular show us that they matter more to the bad wizards. They matter more to dark wizards. Mm -hmm. We know that Voldemort is bad because he wants special objects and a special wand. Mm -hmm. So there is this argument being made in the movies that this beautiful material world of wizard culture is linked more towards the dark sides of culture but that aesthetic simultaneously is what we as viewers find most appealing about the movies mm -hmm. and that is most frequently reproduced in Wizarding World of Harry Potter experiences where you also get to touch all of these exciting special objects, mm -hmm. which is really like Harry Potter tourism brings together the fetishization of the special object mm -hmm. that is linked to dark wizards but is also linked to the way that we engage mm -hmm. with this world which brings us back to how much i want to want mm -hmm. which is not the message i was supposed to get from this movie well you're very stubborn <laughs> <laughs> i can't believe i didn't think about this until just now i wish that i had brought this up while we were in the midst of that conversation but the weasley wizard wheezes shop is all about mass-produced mm -hmm. stuff oh, right yeah. And it's like, not only is it fundamentally good, but our heroes are able to use products from the Weasley's Wizard yeah. Wheezes in order to aid them in yeah. their attempt to, uh, you know, break into the ministry, et cetera, et cetera. Huh. So mass production, I need to qualify my previous claim that mass production is only affiliated with Dark Wizards because, in fact, we have forms of mechanical reproduction that are, in fact... A sort of sign of some of our best wizards. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Man, the status of objects in these movies is yeah. really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I still can't figure out the significance of Horcruxes in terms of the of the aura, because Horcruxes are so forbidden and so so evil in their very concept in Harry Potter, and yet Okay, here's my theory. Special objects in the wizarding world 
can transfer ownership quite easily. Wands, even though you have a wand that is yours and that is given to you, a wand can transfer its allegiance because wands have agency. The Gryffindor sword doesn't belong to anybody. It shows up to whoever needs it most. That kind of ownership of like, this is mine only forever isn't really how people relate to things. But what Voldemort does with the Horcruxes is try to take these special objects that should belong to a community Mm -hmm. like Ravenclaw's diadem, like Hufflepuff Mm -hmm. cup that probably like Gryffindor's sword should circulate through those houses and be usable by a whole community and transfer ownership in a fluid way. And instead he's like, this is mine Mm -hmm. forever. It's like putting your soul in it is like peeing on it times Mm -hmm. a million. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that Voldemort is Margaret Thatcher. You're saying that his plan is to privatize the wizarding world. Yes! I mean, yeah. I mean, we've talked about Umbridge being Margaret Thatcher before, but I thought privatization of ownership, I think, ties in with the with the politics that we've been talking about, like the actual real world politics that we've been talking about these books representing to us. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. We're all brilliant. I also wanted to talk about some miscellaneous filmy things, uh, just in terms of color and the movement of the camera. Yeah, I I just noticed a few interesting things. The camera's movement in this movie seems kind of unusually motivated by the mood of what's going on. Um, At the beginning of the film, for example, when they're having very straightforward conversations with Ollivander and Griphook, the camera is almost stationary, uh, and it just does a very standard shot. During battle scenes, the camera does quite a few tracking shots, which, as we theorized in earlier movies, is supposed to put the focus on the space of Hogwarts itself. Mm -hmm. And I think it does that really interestingly during the battles. Or I should just say really well. I mean, I don't know that anything is particularly unexpected or subversive about it, but it does it quite well. You really get a sense of that courtyard in particular and the stairways in which fighting takes place. I also think it's interesting that when we are in Snape's head uh, in the Pensieve, uh, the camera is sort of constantly moving, but in a strange, unmotivated, dreamlike kind of way, which I just think is interesting because, as you know, previously I've had problems in these movies where flashbacks and visions are shot in exactly the same way. Uh, But I think in this case it's not really possible to mistake that for a flashback or for a vision. It's Snape's thoughts. I really liked the way that that scene was done because in the books, the memories are like a series of discrete memories. Like fade in on this scene, it plays out, fade out, fade in on this scene. And they're chronological and orderly. And in the movie, they are messy and they bleed into each other and they're out of order and they're briefer and they're not always totally coherent. And it just felt to me like a more powerful representation of memory. Yeah. 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 Especially memory that has been warped by years of grief. Right? Yeah. Because who even keeps track of how things fit together when you are heartbroken about something? She's jealous. She's ordinary, and you're special. That's mean, Severus. Um, I also just wanted to point out, and I'm sure everyone's noticed this, and the symbolism is extremely obvious, but of course, Voldemort first attacks Hogwarts at night, Mm -hmm. and then the sun comes up, so the color scheme changes completely over the span of that whole sequence, and the final scenes of the movie before that ridiculous epilogue everything is quite warm it's in yellow earth tones Mm -hmm. whereas before that this movie i found was predominantly black and gray and uh gold interestingly Mm -hmm. i thought there was a lot of gold i think also sort of going back to this earlier conversation we were having about what it means to be a part two and not just a sequel Um, And the ways in which this movie really does uh, play up nostalgia, like you were saying, Hannah, it also 
brings back the score from the first Harry Potter film. Um, and it might also be in the second Harry Potter film as well, but it's like the, it's the classic Harry Potter theme song, um, which does like, it changes throughout all of the movies and it's still relatively similar, um, but changes depending on the director and the tone of the film. And, but then this is, it's just a return to classic Harry Potter and it is, so exciting and it's so like it just gets in your heart and it makes you feel young again like a like an 11 year old getting on a train for the first time leaving your cupboard under the stairs and then because the movie doesn't trust us to be smart enough to like emotionally resonate with that use of music it has to reproduce that effect literally by being like, look, do you see? Look at the 11 year olds getting in its back of the Hogwarts Express. Do you see how everything old is new again or something? It's so odd because sometimes when you watch a movie or you read a book or, or any piece of art, you think, oh, if only they had gone ahead and done something else, if only they had gone a little bit further or done whatever. And that I feel makes it extra tragic when you see something, you think, if only they just hadn't filmed that whole sequence and put it in. Because I actually think, Everything in it, you know, uh, Hogwarts, it's back to business, you know, they put their lives back together and old, you know, fences are mended and, you know, Draco is not the worst person in the world anymore and, you know, they have lives going on and Hogwarts continues. That's all so obvious at the point where the main three characters are standing on that bridge. It's so obvious. I know that people are pretty divided on whether the epilogue is the worst thing ever or great. Where I am on that changes depending on how I'm feeling. But I think we can all agree that this scene, the 19 years later scene in the movie, it's yeah, just it a really travesty. Really Thanks so much for listening to the first ever episode of the Harry Potter Hour, starring feminism, aka episode 16 of Witch Please. You can find the rest of our episodes on our website, witchplease.ca, or you can listen on your podcasting app of choice. Extra special shout outs to people leaving us reviews on iTunes. Those reviews really help new listeners find the show. This week, Botwait left us a lovely review and we think she's neat. You know what else is neat? Our neat merch. Check out society6.com, that's six the number, slash oh witch please, to buy a tote bag or a mug with our charming and intelligent faces on it. Special thanks, as always, to our erstwhile tech support, Trevor Chow Fraser, the robot of our hearts. Hi, how are you doing? And thanks to everyone who's been tweeting at us at Oh Witch Please. Lib S. Coat, Guts Magazine, Fitch M., Deanna Norlock, Trixie Dalek, El Borgon, Laura Shh, Rachel Babe, G's Magazine, T. Valanilla 4, Mel Dogleash, Os Charles or OS Charles, Sarah's Chapter, What Anna Sees, Hazel Jeffs, Marim, Ava S66, Grebditch, Alicia 6166, Rosa Bialski, Karina Soros, Instant Dreams, Lydia Magic, Caesar, or maybe C E Y S R? Either way, let us know. It's Leah Elaine. Zojo Roberts, Krista Brittany, It's Just Roar, Proletarian Arts, Riles Mac, Emily Hoven, Akiko Tree, Rosemary Pip, Louise Ward, Kaltizi, Hi It's Me, Luce Lefty, Ducklin, Lily Actually, Cristala P, Kathy Van Orton, Allison Barron 12, The Audio Signal, CC Streeter, Pewter Wolf 13, It's Moisha, Ms. Megan, Paula Gabrielis, Vic Jones, Danica Shea, Catherine L. Holland, and Retro Cristal. Tune in next time for something not completely different, but also not altogether the same. 
But until then, later, witches.